In this video, we're going to be taking a look and listen to a couple of new-ish microphones from Maono, the PD400X and the PD100U. Maono did send both of these microphones to me to check out, to make a video about, but they don't get any input in this video. They're not going to see it before you do. A couple things. So these are broadcast dynamic style microphones. The PD100U is USB. The PD400X is a combo USB and XLR microphone. You can think of it as uh, directly inspired by, yeah, we'll go with inspired by the Shure MV7, because not only is it a USB and XLR combo mic, but they also have an accompanying piece of software called Mauno Link, which is very, very similar to the Shure Emotive software that you can utilize with the MV7. We're gonna be obviously listening to these microphones. I'll give you some comparisons and also compare it to some of the other broadcast dynamic mics that I have. The Shure MV7X, which is the XLR only version of the MV7. I don't have the original MV7 anymore, but it should sound the same and the Rode Pod mic and the PreSonus PD70. So those are all dynamic microphones, all XLR, and they're all relatively affordable as far as microphones are concerned. So they should be pretty direct competitors with the PD400X. The PD100U is definitely the outlier in this comparison. It's much less expensive than the other microphones that I will be comparing. Throughout the video, I will switch between the XLR and the USB recording. I messed up. I lost the USB uh, recorded audio when I was recording earlier using both the XLR and USB connections at the same time. So I'm gonna have to re-record uh, just the USB. So now you're hearing the USB. I'm not gonna switch back and forth throughout the video, but I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the Mauno Link software. So throughout that whole thing, you'll be listening to the USB connection of this microphone. And then also at the end, when I compare all the different microphones, I'll do a section with uh, via the USB connection. Uh, there as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the Mauno Link software and see what that's all about. So when you plug in a, a microphone that it recognizes, it should show it to you and we'll click on that microphone. Can I make this full screen? You basically have two tabs here. You've got an advanced tab, which I'm in currently, and a standard tab. The standard tab is has some presets in it, so if you don't want to go through and fine tune a lot of the different aspects of the microphone, then just stick with the standard and it'll just kind of give you some blanket presets. So at the top you've got, and you've got a slider for headphone volume, and then you've got a slider for monitor mix, and you have all the same controls on the microphone itself. So if you press in the dial here, uh, right now it's on the, um, oh, I have to go over to the advanced tab. So you can see that um, it's on gain. So this is the actual gain of the microphone. So, you, so the input gain of the microphone itself, you can control that there. And if you press it, now it's the headphone volume, and then press it again, and now it's the monitor mix. So you can do all that physically on the microphone, but you can also do it here in the software. So going back over to the standard, that's headphone, monitor mix. We've already showed that. So the next thing is tone. Uh, here it is on the natural tone. Uh, and now you can hear what it's like if you click over on to the deep tone. So this obviously should emphasize some of the, the lower frequencies. And now here is what it sounds like on the bright tone. So this should be emphasizing some of the mid and high frequencies in whatever it is you're recording. And lastly, there's this one over here called Legacy. And I don't really know exactly what this is supposed to be. Uh, to my ear, it sounds maybe like it's going for kind of a broadcast like radio sound, but I, I'm not exactly sure. Going back over to Natural. And then the last thing you have control over is the distance. So you can see that represented here in this little drawing. So we're in the near setting, and it's uh, indicating that you can be a couple inches away from the microphone. And then if you go to mid, it's going to boost up the gain. So this is basically your gain settings here, but just a very simplified way to think about it. So I can back up a little bit and it should still have a, a decent uh, level for my voice. And then here is the far setting. It's boosting up the gain even more to the point that I can hear in my headphones some, uh, some noise. But I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the noise from my headphones or the noise from the microphone. But anyway, so that's what it's doing, just boosting the gain so that you can adjust your distance from the microphone. So very simple. That's it for the standard section. So going over to advanced, now you have um, some control. If you're familiar with like kind of 
physical controls um, and audio recording, then uh, this is kind of what you'll see over here. So uh, coming down to EQ, we have the presence boost enabled. So this is similar to what the bright setting would be in the standard side. So boosting up some of the mids and high frequencies. Uh, next over here on the left is a high pass filter. So this is cutting out the low frequencies, allowing the high frequencies to pass. So you'll see this uh, sometimes referred to as a low cut filter, but a low cut filter and a high pass filter are two different names for the same thing. And then here is flat. So this should not be boosting or cutting any frequencies. Last one is the high pass filter and the presence boost enabled together. You'll find these kinds of controls either in EQ settings, if you're in software, some microphones have these built into them as well. Speaking of that, this microphone does. There's also a switch on the bottom of the, or a button on the bottom of the microphone. So as I press this button, you have those same controls that you do in the software. So now we're in flat mode. Now we've got the high pass filter. Now we've got the presence boost. And lastly, here is the high pass filter and the presence boost simultaneously. So really cool. I like that uh, the microphone has all the physical controls. It has them in the software. Uh, next, you've got a limiter and you can click that on and then adjust the amount of decibels that are needed for the limiter to kick in. So a limiter is basically so you don't clip your audio. Uh, so now if I go really loud and just start talking and screaming and yelling, I'm not screaming or yelling, but maybe I'm um, being attacked by a bear, a cocaine bear perhaps, no matter how I scream, the limiter is going to kick in at negative 11 decibels and not allow the volume to go above that point. So that's what a limiter does. And then if you click on these little um, buttons here, uh, you have some more some more detailed controls. So you've got an attack and a release. I don't really want to get into the, all the, 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 the nuance of, of these controls, a little bit of, kind of beyond the scope of this video. And I can't really remember, to be honest, how to explain attack and release. And I also don't know exactly what good settings for them are. But if you want to get in here and really listen to your recording and try to figure out uh, the best sound, then you have these options. So that's always good. I'm just going to reset that and confirm. Next, you've got a compressor. So a compressor is basically, it's going to boost the quiet parts. There we go. The quiet parts of your audio, and it's going to bring down the loud part. So it's going to kind of equalize everything to limit the dynamic range, so to speak. So that's what a compressor does. And again, you've got very simply a decibel slider. So what this does is how loud something has to get for the compressor to kick in. You don't necessarily want the compressor to kick in at negative 27 decibels, for instance. It's gonna like really be squishing your audio. You kind of want to play with this and really just want to be bringing down the really loud parts, kind of identify sort of like the peaks, how loud are you getting, and then adjust your compressor to be just a, a little bit below the, that peak. And then again, you've got some more uh, detailed parameters. So attack and release, compression rates, and maximum. I'm not really sure exactly what maximum is. Compression rate, um, this is a ratio. So it goes from one to one all the way up to 20 to one. I can't really explain how this works, but you'll see oftentimes in like voiceover recordings, which is what we're doing here, usually somewhere between like three and five to one, I think is a pretty standard kind of setting that people would go with if you're looking for that advice. Don't take my advice, go to some real audio experts and find out. So that's the software, Monolink, really pretty good. So if you don't want to have to go into software after you've recorded and make a lot of adjustments, then you can do all this stuff right here in the recording, make it sound how you want it to. Obviously, if you're streaming and doing something live, then having this, you know, is going to really help get the audio to sound good for your stream or your live recording. I talked a little bit about the gain knob here and the button on the bottom of the microphone that uh, controls the EQ, essentially. Uh, there's also a mute button on the top here, and this is like a little capacitive button. You don't actually have to press it. If you just kind of slide your finger across the top, you can engage that mute button. And what I found is that it is easy to accidentally mute the microphone if you're trying to reposition it. So you definitely have to be careful with that. And it would um, behoove you <laughs> to have headphones on if you're recording over USB with this microphone. If you do move the microphone a lot, if you're the kind of person who is moving and readjusting, you might find it 
is easy to mute it, and that would be a bummer if you didn't actually record. So that's pretty much it for the physical features of this microphone. Let me go ahead and just talk about some of the negatives. That the capacitive mute button is a potential negative depending on how you utilize the microphone. And the other big negative with the build quality here, as I didn't have that tightened down, is the yoke is nice, but you cannot actually tighten it down enough to where it like it totally moves <laughs> and I'm not even trying to like put a whole lot of force on this thing to move it and it's tightened about as much as I can get it so that's a problem in that it will never stay I mean it's gonna stay in place I guess mostly but it is too easy to move it and my mic stand here has this little clip to hold uh, the cables in if you didn't have a clip like this and you just had the XLR just dangling or just you know going to the floor, it could easily exert enough force to move the microphone. So they definitely need to, if they're going to do any iterations on this microphone or revisions on future shipments, they definitely need to address that. Rubber washers might help to exert a little bit more force on the yoke to keep the microphone in position. This little guy here, the PD100U, has a one-sided yoke, which is nice but um, it also just kind of ratchets down a little bit better. Uh, it's still movable, but I can feel like I'm probably gonna strip it by doing that. Whereas this one, it just feels like it's just freely moving around. The 400X also comes with this really substantial foam windscreen. It's very similar to the one that comes with the Shure SM7B. It's very thick and dense. It also is very difficult to get on and off the microphone, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, you know it's going to you know stay in place. It also comes with an XLR cable, and it is pretty long. To I, I didn't really want to undo it, but because uh, I'm not going to use it, I have XLRs. It's about eight feet, I want to say. I keep muting it. <laughs> Next, let's test plosives. Um, I'm going to rotate the mic around and talk directly into the front. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. It's not great. Uh, and then to just talk across the front of it a little bit like I have been doing this whole time. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. That's kind of how you want to do it. And we'll test it with the windscreen. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. Peter Piper prefers the pod mic for podcasts. Does a pretty good job. One other big criticism, as you can hear in this microphone, so not only is it not very good at rejecting plosives without this windscreen or without you really being careful, it also is very, very susceptible to any handling noise. So it's definitely a microphone that you're going to have to be super careful with during a recording, not to bump the desk or really anything that it's sitting on. Uh, not to bump the stand or the arm that it's on, and certainly not to bump the microphone. So now this is the PD100U. Not going to go into great depth on this microphone, but just do a couple of the tests here, starting with the plosives. Peter Parker prefers the pod mic for podcasts. Peter Parker prefers the pod mic for podcasts. And some handling noise. So this is what it sounds like to handle the stand and move it around a little bit. I don't know. So this microphone doesn't have any uh, headphone monitoring on it. It only has the USB-C cable to plug it into your computer, laptop, or smartphone tablet. So you can't monitor this live while you're recording. You can plug in your headphones to the computer or whatever it is you're recording into, but it's going to be it's uh, going to have some latency. So you're going to hear whatever it is you're recording a little bit after it actually gets recorded. So that's uh, really difficult <laughs> to do live. So the best you can do is just sort of make sure that the levels are good. So you can put the headphones on, listen uh, to whatever it is you're recording for a few seconds or however long it takes for you to get the levels right, and then take the headphones off, do the recording, and hopefully you're good. You can also obviously look at the levels that you're recording in whatever software to make sure that it's uh, at a decent level. This actually looks really low, so I'm gonna have to boost that up. But anyway, it's a very bare bones microphone. Let's go ahead and jump into the audio samples and I'm gonna be recording the XLR mics into Adobe Audition 
utilizing the Audion Evo 4, which is a relatively budget-friendly USB audio interface, and I'm not going to be doing any processing to the signal. So the only thing I'll do to each one is just boost up the levels uh, in post so that they all match. One sultry evening early in July, a young man emerged from the small furnished lodging he occupied in a large five-storied house in the Paralook S, and turned slowly with an air of indecision towards the K Bridge. He was fortunate enough not to meet his landlady on the stairs. She occupied the floor beneath him, and her kitchen, with its usually open door, was entered from the staircase. Thus, whenever the young man went out, he found himself obliged to pass under the enemy's fire, which always produced a morbid terror, humiliating him and making him knit his brows. He owed her some money and felt afraid of encountering her. On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S Place and walked slowly, as though in hesitation, towards K Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with garret, dinners, and attendance lived on the floor below, and every time he went out, he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed, the young man had a sick, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S Place and walked slowly, as though in hesitation, towards K Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with garret, dinners, and attendance lived on the floor below, and every time he went out, he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed, the young man had a sick, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. One sultry evening early in July, a young man emerged from the small furnished lodging he occupied in a large five-story house in the Paralook S, a little acid reflux, and turned slowly with an air of indecision towards the K Bridge. He was fortunate enough not to meet his landlady on the stairs. She occupied the floor beneath him, and her kitchen, with its usually open door, was entered from the staircase. Thus, whenever the young man went out, he found himself obliged to pass under the enemy's fire which always produced a morbid terror, humiliating him and making him knit his brows. He owed her some money and felt afraid of encountering her. One sultry evening early in July, a young man emerged from the small furnished lodgings he occupied in a large five-storied house in the Paralook S, and turned slowly with an air of indecision towards the K Bridge. He was fortunate enough not to meet his landlady on the stairs, she occupied the floor beneath him, and her kitchen, with its usually open door, was entered from the staircase. Thus, whenever the young man went out, he obliged himself. He found himself obliged to pass under the enemy's fire, which always produced a morbid terror, humiliating him and making him knit his brows. He owed her some money and felt afraid of encountering her. One sultry evening early in July, a young man emerged from the small furnished lodging he occupied in a large five-storied house in the Paralook S and turned slowly with an air of indecision towards the K Bridge. He was fortunate enough not to meet his landlady on the stairs. She occupied the floor beneath him and her kitchen, with its usually open door, was entered from the staircase. Thus, Whenever the young man went out, he found himself obliged to pass under the enemy's fire, which always produced a morbid terror, humiliating him and making him knit his brows. He owed her some money and felt afraid of encountering her.